Hello. So for this video for Black History Month 2023, we're going to take a close look at Langston Hughes's poem, Theme for English B. Um, Hughes was probably the most famous, uh, today at least, is definitely the most famous of the Harlem Renaissance poets, um, people who uh, came of age in the 1920s primarily, <clears throat> the World War I generation up through um, the 1930s. And the tone of the Harlem Renaissance does sort of shift over those periods. But in the 20s, you really have sort of the jazz age. And this is when people like Hughes particularly shine. Um, Theme for English B is one of his most important poems. It's one of his most famous alongside uh, works like Harlem. I too, and the Negro Speaks of Rivers, which are really famous anthologized works. Theme for English B is one of his beloved poems, one of his very commonly anthologized poems. I think it's particularly beloved of English instructors like myself because of its subject matter. Uh, but we're going to take a close look at it, and we're going to see what Hughes is doing in this poem. So this is Theme for English B. Um, First off, it's worth noting this is a narrative poem. It tells a story, but it also reflects on the context that has created that story. So, uh, the poem starts out, The instructor said, go home and write a page tonight. And let that page come out of you. Then it will be true. I wonder if it's that simple. I'm 22, colored, born in Winston-Salem. I went to school there, then Durham, then here, to this college on the hill above Harlem. I'm the only colored student in my class. The steps from the hill lead down into Harlem, through the park, then I cross St. Nicholas, 8th Avenue, 7th, and I come to the Y, the Harlem branch Y, where I take the elevator up to my room, sit down, and write this page. It's not easy to know what is true for you or me at, eight, at 22, my age, but I guess I'm what I, see, I feel and see and hear. Harlem, I hear you. Hear you, hear me, we too, you, me, talk on this page. I hear New York too. Me, who? Well, I like to sleep, eat, uh, I like to eat, sleep, drink, and be in love. I like to work, read, learn, and understand life. I like a pipe for a Christmas present, or records, Bessie, Bop, or Bach. I guess being colored doesn't make me not like the same things other folks like who are other races. So will my page be colored that I write? Being me, it will not be white. But it will be a part of you, instructor. You are white, yet a part of me as I am a part of you. That's American. Sometimes, perhaps, you don't want to be a part of me, nor do I often want to be a part of you. But we are. That's true. As I learn from you, I guess you learn from me, although you're older and white and somewhat more free. This is my page for English B. So it's a narrative poem, right? It tells the story of the poet persona, being given this assignment, a very standard old school assignment. Um, it very, like this was the kind of thing that, that English instructors used to do all the time and now are, are not as much doing, which just sort of like go and write on some topic. And there's no real more instruction than that. Um, so this, this sounds like it's supposed to be some kind of personal narrative assignment, something like this. And so Hughes is fulfilling that via the mechanism of the poem. There's a couple of really interesting moves here, a couple of things that are really important about the approach that he's taking. So we've got the setup, right? And again, this would be recognizable for people who had gone to school in the 20s. This would be the kind of thing that they, they would have understood. But then this question, I wonder if it's that simple. So this is, this is the first introduction of doubt. We have here a kind of rhetorical question, a challenging of the premise of the assignment, right? Because the premise is that if you write from yourself, if you say what you think, what you feel, what you believe, then it will be true. We get here the undermining of that equation. Um, is it going to be true? Is it, is it 
as simple as that. Is truth simply expressing what we think or feel? And this raises the all-important question, I think, for this poem, which is, what does it mean that we feel what we feel, particularly for African Americans? We'll talk more about that as we get later into the poem. So we have a really interesting blend here of these sort of basic biographical details. So these lines, I am 22, colored, born in Winston-Salem. I went to school there, then Durham, then here to this college on the hill above Harlem. Um, we have a little bit later on. Well, I like to eat, sleep, drink, and be in love. I like to work, read, learn, and understand life. I like a pipe for a Christmas present or records, Bessie, Bop, or Bach. These are these sort of seemingly trivial details about who this poet persona is, who the speaker here is. But these are also mixed in with much more meaningful details, things that are weighted with significance. Um, and, and that's not to say that these sort of surface level details are not important because they really, really are. But I think they are they are here to give us a sort of blending of what it means to be a human being. These sort of basic biographical details. I was born in Winston-Salem. I went to school in Durham. Then I came to this college. Sure. That's true about this speaker. If the assignment is let that page come out of you, then it will be true. Yeah, we're getting that truth. But these are also flat truths in some ways, right? These are, these are facts about the world. But then there's other things here that are not facts about the world necessarily, or that are straddling that line, where they are facts about the world, but they are meaningful. They have a larger implication. I am the only colored student in my class. This line that immediately follows that first spate of biographical details. This is, on the surface of it, another one of those straight biographical facts. We are just learning this. This would be objectively, measurably, observably true. But it's also more significant. It tells us something about the experience of the speaker as an African American. To pursue higher education, especially in the 20s for an African American, was to be isolated. It was to enter a world that was not the world of African Americans. That was the world of white people. And so this, I'm the only colored student in my class. Um, you instructor, you are white. Again, addressing the instructor, although you're older and white. This is a detail this line, I am the only college student in my class. This is a detail that introduces the idea of isolation, the idea that there are divided worlds within the United States of the 1920s, and that that division is significant. And this is going to become much more important as we get down into especially the last stanza of this poem, um, or the second to last stanza, since technically this last line is the, the last stanza. This penultimate stanza, I guess, um, that becomes much more important, that idea. But we also, again, get that developed in, so this is our, I guess I'd call this all the first stanza, even though you've got breaks here for the prompt. Um, so as we get down into this second stanza, we have that idea developed in a little bit more detail. So again, we've got that set of biographical details. Here are things about me as an individual. But we've also got, I'll, I'll come back to this opening bit of this stanza, but I think this is really interesting. These two lines right here, I guess being colored doesn't make me not like the same things other folks like who are other races. 
again, one of the one of the things that we have sort of problematized here is this Jim Crow era ethos of segregation. This idea that African Americans and white Americans should be separated. Why? On what basis? To be African American is to be American. And this is where part of the thing starts to come in. This sort of this fundamental assumption of segregated society, that there was a crucial and insurmountable distinction between the races. In what does that insurmountable distinction consist? I mean, this is one of the things that we actually see a lot with Harlem Renaissance literature. Uh, we see with some, uh, we see problematized more with some later African American literature. Um, this idea that this speaker or this character, uh, this individual as an African American enjoys the same kind of things that white Americans enjoy, that their culture is aligned with white culture. Um, we see this in um, what's the name of the play? Um, Harlem Duet by Janet Sears, Janet Barnes. For some reason, I can never remember which which one it is. I mean, I'll look it up just a second because it's going to bother me. Otherwise, Harlem Duet, Janet Sears. Yes, Janet Barnes is a is a different person. Um, so uh, that's one of the things that we see in uh, Harlem Duet. The character of Othello in the the modern scenes in that play says, "I." read the same kind of books that my white colleagues read. I listen to the same kind of music. I talk about the same kinds of topics. I go to the same parties, all these things. So if the poet persona of this poem, of, of Hughes's poem, likes the same kind of things that white Americans like, where's the difference? What, what, what difference does it make? that his skin is darker, that his ancestors came from Africa rather than just from Europe. I don't know. Hugh, Hughes probably had some European ancestry as well. Many African-Americans do uh, because of the horrendous legacy of pervasive, pervasive rape in, slave, uh, in slavery. Um, but what what difference does it really make? This is one of the, the issues, one of the questions raised by the poem. Um, turning back toward the beginning of this stanza, um, we have again that issue of uncertainty, right? That, that, that idea raised at the beginning of that, or, or at the middle, I guess, of this first stanza, I wonder if it's that simple. We start with, it's not easy to know what is true for you or me at, at 22, my age. This idea that Self-knowledge is not simple and straightforward. It's not as easy as what the assignment, go and write a page that comes from you, would imply. And so that's part of the thing that gets introduced here. And we have this tension that we, again, see throughout this poem, um, this soliloquy, no, um, apostrophe to Harlem, this brief few lines here, um, an apostrophe in, uh, in literary terms is when you address a speaker or, or you address a character or an entity or something like this who is not physically present. So it's not a conversation, but it is an address to something or someone absent. So when the, the speaker says here, but I guess I'm what I see, I feel and hear and see. Harlem, I hear you. Hear you, hear me, we too, you, me, talk on this page. I hear New York too. Me? Who? So this idea that who this speaker is, is rooted in place, is rooted in a context. Harlem has shaped this speaker. And so this is actually part of the reason why these earlier details are significant. Born in Winston-Salem, went to school in Durham before coming to Harlem. 
But this idea of being shaped by Harlem, engaging with Harlem, is really, really significant. And then, because Harlem, as many people know, um, is a predominantly African American neighborhood, right? still today, I believe, is um, I think gentrification has hit a little bit, but I think it's one of my senses. I could be wrong if I'm if I'm off the mark here. You can let me know in the comments. But my sense is Harlem has resisted gentrification better than some other neighborhoods in, in cities like New York. Um, but Harlem in the 20s was almost exclusively African-American. Um, the white people who came into Harlem in the 20s tended to be um, socialites, tended to be fairly wealthy, fairly well-off people who sort of came because being around African Americans was exciting in a time when um, races were not supposed to mix. So when the speaker is addressing Harlem, I feel and hear and see Harlem, I hear you. This is an address to a, a black culture, an African American culture almost exclusively. But we also get I hear New York too, the implication being white New York or multicultural New York, because of course, New York is one of the most multicultural cities uh, in the world. Um, people of every ethnic background congregate in New York. Um, some of my own ancestors, my grandparents, my dad uh, were from New York City. Um, so that idea of that, that sort of tension between Harlem as a predominantly or almost exclusively African-American neighborhood versus the larger metropolis of New York. So that tension of what does it mean to be me from my subject position as an African-American in the 20s in Harlem is sort of pulled through these first couple of stanzas. And I think it's really in this second to last stanza that we get the most overt turn toward um, this idea that W.E.B. Du Bois uh, pioneered of double consciousness. This idea that the structuring tension of African-American identity, according to Du Bois, was the sense of being an American, but also not properly being an American. This sort of Aware, double awareness of the self as inextricably shaped by America, by U.S. history, by U.S. culture, and yet at the same time being excluded from that culture, right? Because um, people, as people like um, Marcus Garvey found out with the sort of Back to Africa movement, African Americans are very different than Africans. The experience, the collective experience of African Americans is culturally different and has shaped them to, to produce a different collective unconscious, if you will, than the experience of Africans. Regard And Africans obviously don't have a singular experience. African Americans don't have a singular experience. I'm not trying to reduce this in any way. Um, but there are major, major differences between the cultures, the experiences, the life world views of African Americans and of Africans, generally speaking. And so African Americans are not Africans. They are Americans, but they are also positioned as external to proper American culture, which is often identified as white Anglo-Saxon inspired American culture. So this becomes a really significant theme. Uh, du Bois is obviously an incredibly influential thinker in uh, African-American circles, as well as the larger context of understanding American literature, American culture, um, American arts, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is the stanza that really takes us into that idea of double consciousness. Being me, so this, Stanza, second stanza ends with this question. So will my page be colored that I write? And then the third stanza begins. Being me, it will not be white, but
but it will be a part of you, instructor. You are white, yet a part of me as I am a part of you. That's American. And Hughes writes a lot about what it means to be an American. Um, this is a very, very common theme. But this idea of the, th the page that he writes, the theme of, for English B that he writes, will be both African American and white American. It will be both because it has come out of this fusion of cultures, this fusion of ethnicities, this fusion of races that is America. So the idea of you, uh, the instructor who is white shaping this, me, the writer who is African American shaping this, that's American. Again, this is that double consciousness idea that I, African American identity is both American and external to American, excluded from the American experience. So we're seeing that really developed here through poetry. Um, and what we get is, again, this very efficient and very straightforward, very direct analysis of what that kind of tension means, what that racial tension means, both for the larger culture of the nation, but also for the individual psyche of this speaker. Sometimes perhaps you don't want to be a part of me, nor do I often want to be a part of you. Racial tension, racial hatred, racial violence that pervaded the 1920s, even in New York City, even in the North. Um, we often think of this as primarily a Southern problem uh, today, but it was not. It was a national problem. Um, so that tension is explored here. But we are, that's true. This idea, this acknowledgement that African Americans and white Americans inextricably have shaped one another's collective experiences. We cannot avoid race, we cannot avoid racism, we cannot avoid the heritage of racial prejudice in this country and still know ourselves. So that's a really crucial thing. And then this is tied to learning. As I learn from you, I guess you learn from me. Again, this idea that we are mutually supportive, that we are mutually coming to understand ourselves by coming to terms with race. And then I find this bit really, really interesting. Um, I guess you learn from me, although you're older and white and somewhat more free. I find that word somewhat incredibly interesting and important. Why just somewhat, right? In the, in the racial hierarchy of 1920s America, white people were free, ostensibly. But I think that what Hughes is gesturing toward here is this idea that because society is structured along racial lines, because it is structured along uh, the lines of inequality, no one is genuinely free. As a white person, this instructor has to police racial boundaries, has to be aware of that and be locked into that model, not to the same extent that the speaker as an African American does, but the white, the white person is implicated in this as well. Um, and in, in a way, this is kind of related to um, what Thomas Jefferson says. If we go all the way back, to his notes on the state of Virginia, right? He argues in that text that slavery is wrong, not so much because it is bad for African Americans, but because it is it is morally bad for white people to own slaves. Now Hughes is not saying that. Hughes is Hughes is by no stretch of the imagination saying, "Oh, it was fine for Africans and African Americans to have been enslaved." but really white people suffered. No, he's not saying that by any stretch of the imagination. What he's saying here, I think, is African Americans are the primary victims of this system of racial inequality and racial injustice, but you 
my white instructor, you, my fellow Americans who are not African-American, you are also victims of this system, whether you realize it or not. So I think that's what's going on in this poem. That's how I read theme for English B. Again, I think it's a brilliant, brilliant poem. Um, and it, it works through these questions of like, what does it mean to express truth? What does it mean to, um, what does it mean to present oneself, to understand oneself in the context of racial inequality in the United States.